Father, I thank you for your word. God, it says that we are sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. God, I thank you for that reality, God. I thank you that you would bear even bear witness with our spirit today, God, that we are children of God. Father, we honor you. God, we honor you as our Father in heaven. We say, hallowed be your name. We honor you as the one true living God. We honor you, Lord Jesus, as the one whose name is above every name, our Savior, our Lord, our King. And God, I pray even today, Lord, that the love of God would be poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God, I thank you. God, your word says that, Lord. So I pray that that would be a reality today during this time. God, I pray you'd open up the scriptures to us. You'd open up your word. God, I pray that your word would do its work today in our hearts. God, to bring revelation, to bring transformation. God, to change us to bring repentance where it's needed, to bring renewal of the mind where it's needed. God, to root us and ground us in you and in your heart and in your love today, Father. And so, Father, we give you this time. We thank you for this time. We honor you. We worship you. We praise you. God, we give you thanks today. And we continue to give you this service and what you want to do here in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a clap of praise. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Welcome, and thank you, worship team, for being here tonight and helping to lead us to God's presence. We have some some of the regional team here that we do once a month here on these third Sundays. Welcome to the Father's Day edition of our revival service. Come on now. Looking forward to what God wants to do. Um, This waterfall here is interesting. Dewey told me I should try to I should I should slide down it during my serve uh, during my sermon, but I told him probably not, right, Dewey? I'm like, probably not. Thanks, Cheryl. Keep me keep me in check up here. Yeah, <laughs> there's a VBS uh, Living Hopes on their VBS. I think it's actually not tomorrow, but next Monday. But they've been setting up all the all the stuff as you can see. So, um, if you have a Bible, <clears throat> open up to First John, chapter three. We're going to actually be primarily in Luke 15 tonight, but we're going to start on uh, 1 John 3, just as a kind of a springboard here. We've been doing a series on the love of God and um, this message here, even though this is our uh, revival service, it's really going to kind of fit into it and really kind of be the end of this series on the love of God. I want to talk about receiving the Father's love, and I want to talk about hindrances to receiving the Father's love, different things that can hinder us from actually staying in the love of God. And so we're going to start here, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John's toward the end of the New Testament, shortly before the book of Revelation. So if you go to Revelation and go back a few, um, it'll be there. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. That's a lot right there. Just that one verse, just that one sentence is saying a lot. Behold, what manner of love? What kind of love is this? Look, behold, look at um, what the awesomeness of this, the awe of this. What manner of love is this that we should be called? What manner of love has the Father bestowed on us that we should be called children of God? Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, this is as, as Jesus comes back, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So John is expounding here on what it means to be a child of God. But he starts out with this statement on, behold, like the wonder of this. Like this, sometimes because we've, we hear this, and if you've been in church for a long time, or if you grew up in a Christian family, you, know, you hear about, you know, we're, we're children of God through faith in Christ, and maybe sometimes it loses the awe and the wonder. He's trying to bring us to this place of awe and wonder in this statement. You know, behold, what amazing love, what manner of love is this that we should be called children of God? The Father has bestowed this love upon us. And if you read the context of this, which again, I'm not going to get into a lot here because I want to get to Luke 15 in a few minutes. But if you read the context here, he, he actually talks about how being children of God leads to living in a, a righteous life. That's actually the whole context of this. 
And, and, and it's, beca- it's, it's because living a righteous life actually becomes the byproduct of being a child of God. He says, because God's seed is in you, you actually live righteous. Because God's word dwells in you, because God's seed lives in you, because God's nature lives in you, it actually produces a righteous life. It's not you live a righteous life and so then God calls you his child. It's no, you're born again by his word and by his spirit and then his nature is inside of you and then you begin to live a righteous life. Does that make sense? That's the gospel. That's the new covenant that, that he comes to live inside of us. And, you know, we've talked about this before at different times, but how one of the purposes for Jesus coming to this earth was to show us the Father, was to give us the clearest revelation of God that we could actually ever receive is in the person of Jesus Christ. Because he is God himself in, in, in the flesh, in human form. He, he literally is God from the beginning. He's eternal, the eternal son of God. And he came to this earth and he lived the perfect life, but he said, I've come to show you the Father. And throughout the Old Testament, there really was only glimpses of the revelation of God as Father. But in the New Testament, it becomes a much more prominent theme. In the Old Testament, we know God first as creator, right? From Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created. We know God as creator. We know God as sovereign. We know God as holy. We know God as the judge, the righteous judge. We know that he is good. We know that he's just. And there's only little hints and little glimpses of this concept that God is our Father. For those who are children of God, for those who are born again, for those who've placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he actually is our Father. This is incredible. This is incredible when you think about the role of a father and then you place that on God. Like it's one thing to to see that God is the creator and he's the all-powerful one. And by the way, the revelation of God as father doesn't take away from any of the other attributes of who he is. He, He still is the creator. He still is the judge. He still is the sovereign one. He still is the holy one. He still is good and just. And all these, all the, all the revelations that we have of God throughout the, throughout the scriptures, they don't change because God is Father, but it, but it actually brings this other part of the equation into it to bring a fuller revelation and picture of who God is. So imagine the role of a father. A father is one who brings forth life, but it doesn't just bring forth life. A father is one who takes responsibility for to provide, to protect, to lead, to correct, to discipline, to shelter, right? All these different attributes, to, to feed, all these things. And, and the, the, the fact that God would call himself father to us is actually astounding. It's actually astounding that the same one who is the creator is also our father. That the same one who is the all-powerful, all-sovereign, almighty God is our Father. Like, this is really mind-blowing. Like, I want God to give me a deeper revelation of this. I don't know about you. I want God to actually remove from me the familiarity or with this concept, because we get familiar with the concept and it loses that awe. I, I don't want that. I want my mind to be renewed. I want to see this in a fresh way. That I could be like John and say, behold, what manner of love is this? Like, how amazing is this? Like, God is my father. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. And God intended that this revelation of him as father and this revelation of his love for us would be a foundation that we lived from. That's why the Apostle Paul, he taught us in Ephesians, he was praying for the Ephesians that they'd be rooted and grounded in love because he wanted that to be a foundation that we live from. And I thought Joey in his message a couple weeks ago did an awesome job. He was talking about the love of God in the Trinity, in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And and one of the things he pointed out is, it says this in, in the book of Jude, 1 verse 21, it says, he says, Beloved, keep yourselves in the love of God. That's an interesting statement. Talking to believers. That means it's possible for us to get ourselves out of 
that flow of the love of God. Not that he doesn't love us anymore, but we're not receiving it. We're not standing in it. We're not staying in it. And in, in today's message, where, where we're going to go and we're going to get into in Luke 15, I'm going really, to talk about, I think, two primary ways that we can get out of the love of God. Again, not that he stops loving you, but we're no longer receiving it. We're no longer living in it. We're no longer standing in it. We're no longer rooted in it. And I think there's two primary ways that this can happen that um, we're going to see from Luke chapter 15. So turn there, Luke chapter 15. I encourage you to really ask the Holy Spirit to give you insight in this because even though this is a familiar story, this is a familiar parable, sometimes God wants to show us new things in it and um, wants to speak to us through it. So I encourage you not to check out if, if you think, well, I've heard this story a lot. I've read this story many times. Literally, I was weeping today reading this story. Earlier today, I was praying over this message. I was reading, and I, every time, Every time I get to a certain part, I just, and I'm hoping that God will give us a fresh revelation of the Father's heart through this passage and through this teaching tonight. In Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11, it's known as the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the lost son. Maybe it should be called the parable of the loving father. Because maybe he should be the main focus and the main character in this story. But it says this. I'm going to read the, the entire parable before I start teaching through it and expounding on it and asking the Holy Spirit to bring it home in our hearts. Luke 15, starting at verse 11. He said, this is Jesus talking, and he was in the midst of giving different parables, showing God's heart for the lost, essentially, if you go back into context. <clears throat> he said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father... Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land. He began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the, his fields to feed swine. He would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself... He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants." And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. This my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. As he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. He said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. 
Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. He said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Amen. What a story. And we know it's a parable. And we know there's symbolism that Jesus uses in parables. And there's different ways that uh, uh, different symbolism can be taught. And the Holy Spirit can give us different um, revelation and angles on, on certain parts of this, uh, these, these parables and these passages. Because most of the time, when parables are given in the scriptures, there's not given any explanation for them. There is a few exceptions, like the parable of the four soils, the sower. Jesus gives a very clear explanation. They ask him. Uh, but, but in many cases, it's not. And so, you know, we see a story like this, and there's different um, things we can glean from it, different things we can learn from it. But I actually believe that the, these two sons represent two different ways that we can get ourselves out of the love of God. Two different ways that are kind of like opposites, but they're actually two branches from the same tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree that they ate from in the very beginning. The tree that they ate from in the Garden of Eden when God told them not to eat from this tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When they ate from that tree, they introduced these two veins that keep us distant from the love of God. And one is called lawlessness and one is called legalism. And guess what? They're two branches from the same tree. Both are the fruit of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil instead of living out of an abiding relationship with the Father. Did you know that legalism came in because they ate from that tree? Not just sin, not just lawlessness, not just perversion, not just murder, not just sexual sin, not just the things that we think of as bad things. But do you know that every religious system that is not the relationship with God came because they ate from that tree? I mean, it's called the knowledge of good and evil. That sounds like legalism to me. That sounds like religious system to me. It, these two streams came into humanity and they both disconnect us from a vital relationship with God. And these two sons represent these streams, these uh, mindsets or these behaviors that can actually take us out from that place of standing in the love of the Father. And so Jesus tells this parable, and he wants us to know what God is like. He wants us to know part of the characteristics of the Father. And so it says that there's a certain man who has two sons. And this younger son, this younger son, he comes to the father and says, Dad, give me what belongs. Give me my inheritance. Give me my portion of the goods. Give me my portion. This, it seems, based on this story, it would appear that this father was very wealthy based on just the different um, dynamics that we see and you know, the, the, the big party that happens and all the servants he has. So let's just, you know, it, it seems clear he's a very wealthy person. And so the son, this younger son, goes to the father and he, he entreats him and says, Dad, I want my inheritance now. Now, there's different interpretations of that. Some people have said that this implies that, you know, the younger son was treating his father as if he was dead to him because, you know, typically you get an inheritance once a father dies. I've also read from other scholars that say in that time period, it wasn't always abnormal. It wasn't abnormal to receive an inheritance necessarily while, while, while the person was living. So I don't exactly know, but it's, I, I think that's a unique way to look at it. Like maybe, maybe the problem wasn't that he asked for the inheritance. Maybe he was really good at praying and receiving answers. Right? Jesus said, ask, you'll receive. Seek, you'll find. Maybe he was really good at praying and faith and receiving an answer. And notice that when he received it, not only did he receive it, but the other brother received it too. Did you catch that? Little detail? Verse 
He divided to them his livelihood. Not only did the younger son get an inheritance, so did the older son. His petition actually brought breakthrough for his brother as well. Interesting. Now, here's what we don't know about the story. Here's what we don't know. And again, it's a parable. It's not a real life story. But we don't, what we don't know is, did the son intend to take the money and run? I don't know. It doesn't say that. Like maybe he did, or maybe he took it, and then once he had it, he realized what he could do with it. Maybe he realized once he received the blessing, once he received the inheritance, maybe he's like, wow, look what I have. I don't even need, to, I don't even need my dad anymore. I don't really even need his help anymore. I don't really need his provision because I have all this wealth now. I have all this resource now. What if I just, you know, went out on my own for a little bit? What if I just tried this? What if I just went to this place? We don't know. It says not many days later. So we don't know if he intended to do it from the beginning or once he received it, he realized what he could do. And it's a warning for us as believers too, that when God blesses us, this warning is all throughout scripture, by the way, that when God blesses us, we face new temptations that we didn't face before. When God gives you the big answer to your prayer, whether it's for spiritual things or physical things or financial things, when God provides in an abundance, when God pours out his Holy Spirit in big anointing, how many people have we seen this happen to in, in, in real life? They receive a big answer to prayer. They receive a great anointing. They receive, once they have that, it's like, oh, wow, look what I could do now. Look what I have now. And if they're not careful, they drift away from the Father's house. They drift away from the Father's love. And they begin to use what God gave them for selfish ends. They begin to use the very thing the Father gave them for the purpose of serving him and advancing his kingdom and advancing his name. And they begin to use it to advance their own name. They begin to use it for their own pleasure, for their own glory. The very thing that God bestowed upon them. And if we're not careful, we can do that with God's blessings. If we're not careful, we can do that with the very things we cry out for, the very things we ask God for, the very things that we, we need, but, but he gives us an abundance. And I want you to notice something about the Father. The Father does not force anyone to love him. The Father did not force his son to stay in his house. Why? Because love doesn't do that. Love does not force a relationship. Love does not force you to love back in return. Like, do you know how much God sub subjected himself to pain when he made humanity? Like, how much pain he subjected, how much grief he subjected himself to by creating humans made in the image of God that have the choice to follow him or not? that have the choice to love him back or not, that have the choice to give him thanks when he blesses them or not. Because love doesn't force relationship. Love doesn't force the person to love them back in return. And so imagine the grief of this father who loves his children, who loves both of his sons, and he, he bestows this blessing upon both of them, really. I mean, the, the younger son asked for it, but then they both receive it. But the, and that's, that's the nature of God is he does not force us to love him. And so this younger son represents in this teaching I'm doing here, represents lawlessness. Lawlessness. Lawlessness is basically rebellion or living in unrepentant sin. It's saying, you know what? I'm just going to go do my own thing now. I'm just going to go live how I want to live. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to live for myself. I'm going to live for pleasure. I'm going to live for whatever I want. This, this, is, this is a life of lawlessness that basically leaves behind the ways of God, the word of God, the standards of God, and says, I'm just going to do what I want to do. Do you, know, do you know that that's what the devil tempts people with? 
do what you want to do. That's actually what he tries to pull people into. He doesn't pull people into something and say, follow the devil. Most people would never go for that. But you know what most people do go for? Follow yourself. Do what you want to do. Do what makes you happy. Do what makes you pleased. And it leads to a life of lawlessness because what ends up happening is the flesh builds. And when you give yourself to the flesh, it's never satisfied. And so the more and more you give yourself to it, the more and more it requires to be fed. And the more and more you know, sin ends up hurting you and hurting other people because now you're doing it at other people's expense. And now you're doing it to get what you want to do. And it's not only causing damage in your life, it's causing damage in other people's lives. And that's a lifestyle of lawlessness. And I want you to notice that when this younger son, when he left the father's house and he said he, he wasted the inheritance with prodigal living, wasteful living, sinful lifestyle, he was no longer connected to the father's love. That doesn't mean the father didn't love him anymore. We can see that the father still loved him. We can see the father was waiting eagerly for him, was hoping for him to return. We see that by his response. But even though that father loved him, he was not living in the father's love. He was not connected to the father's love. He was out of the father's house. He was out on his own. He was independent. And so it disconnected him from receiving the Father's heart for him, the Father's love for him. That's what lawlessness does. It it causes us to drift away from the love of God. It causes us to drift away from the Father's house. The more we give ourselves to sin, the more we give ourselves to immorality, the more we give ourselves to just living our own way, the way we want to live, not being in submission to God, not being in submission to his word, the more we live that way, we're actually not keeping ourselves in the love of God. And it's actually a false perspective of the love of God that says, well, God loves us so we can do whatever we want. That's actually a false version of God's love. So this younger son, we know ends up in in bad shape, right? Because he wastes all the inheritance. He squanders it in wasteful living, sinful living, And then comes a famine. The famine comes and he's got nothing left. He has nothing to live on. And so he sells himself to to a a citizen of that area. And it says he's feeding the swine, which if you know the context here, if you're in a Jewish culture, that's like the lowest, least, that's like the most unclean thing you could do, right? This is like the lowest of the low. And he was so desperate he would have even eaten the pig food. And then he has a moment of awakening. In verse 17, it describes it like this. He came to himself. Other translations say he came to his senses. He woke up. This is one of the most beautiful pictures of repentance in the Bible. This whole, this story. It's one of the most beautiful pictures of repentance. This is what repentance looks like. What this young man did when he was in the pig pen and he came to his senses and how he described it and how he turned, this is a beautiful picture of repentance. It says, he came to himself. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? But here I am. I'm I'm dying of hunger out here, he says. I will arise. I'll go to my father. I'll say to him. He doesn't just say, I'll go home. He says, I'll go to my father. I'll say to him, I have sinned. He didn't make an excuse. He didn't say, well, you know, I was, this happened to me. And so I just, this, you know, the devil made me do it. And you know, all, he didn't make any excuses. He took full responsibility. And, and here's the truth. Certain circumstances and the, you know, the, yes, the devil is real. The devil tempts, demonic influence is real. And sometimes you know, we're, we're living out of past trauma and past hurts and all that, all that can be a factor. But I want you to notice that he didn't blame it on anybody else but himself. 
Even, all, even though all those things can be a factor, even though past wounds in our life, past traumas and past rejections or temptations or, you know, we fall in with the wrong crowd and they, they, they take us this way or that way or, you know, the, the devil's tempting us. Like, all those things can be true. All those can factor in. But I want you to notice he took full responsibility and he only blamed himself. I have sinned. Which is not what Adam and Eve did, right? When God confronted them in the garden, Right? They, play, they start the blame game. She made me do it. The devil made me do it. Right? They start pointing, God, you, you did it. You, you gave me this woman. Right? I mean, they're pointing the finger all over the place, except for owning it and saying, I did it. Right? But this, this son, he says, I have sinned against heaven, against you. There's no other way around it. There's no other way to say it. There's no other way to make it sound nicer, to make it, to, you know, to um, use nicer words and language, to soften it, right, to soften the blow. It's like, no, I have sinned. And then he takes it further. He says, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. It's like, I, I don't even deserve to be called one of your children anymore. But if you'll, if you'll just take me back and I'll at least be like one of your servants. I'll at least, I'll, I'll work for you. I'll, I'll serve in your house. And so he, this, is, this is his repentance. This is his turning. And again, this is one of the most beautiful pictures of repentance in the Bible. What is repentance? It's turning. It's turning. It is a change of your heart and your mind that leads to a change of behavior. It's a change on the inside that leads to an outward change. See, first he came to his senses. First he turned on in his heart. Then he turned direction. He got up and he started going back. That's what repentance is. You change on the inside. You change your mind. You change your heart about something, about sin, about deception, about whatever it is, about your relationship with God, and you turn you make that change on the inside. And then that leads to a change of behavior, a turning in your life, where we get changed and transformed. And so he does this. He has this awakening. He comes to his senses. He takes responsibility. He starts turning back. He starts making his way back to the Father's house. In verse 20 is the one that always just hits me. He arose and came to his father when he was still a great way off. His father saw him. His father saw him and had compassion and ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. The son begins to say what he was planning to say, and he doesn't, he, he's not able to finish the full scope of it. He starts to, he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I'm not even worthy. But, but he doesn't get through his whole, he, he gets through the first sentence, doesn't get him to the next sentence. And the, the father is so overjoyed, he says, let's celebrate. We're going to celebrate. Get the fatted calf. Get a robe. Put a robe on him. I mean, so this son is full of shame. He's full of guilt. He's full of condemnation. He's full of all this stuff going on. And the father right away restores him to the place of a son. Restores him to the place of a son. With authority in the house. Cleans him up. Puts on the nice robe. Puts on the ring says, kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a big celebration. We're going to have a big party that my son, who is dead, now he's alive. He's back. You see, the answer to lawlessness is repentance. That's the answer. When we've been deceived by sin, when we've been drawn into it, when we've walked into it, when we've lived in it, when we've 
gotten away from the Father's house, when we, there, there's, no other, there's no other remedy but repentance. We might need deliverance. We might need healing. But first, there has to be repentance. Repentance is what took this younger son from the pig pen to the father's house. Repentance was the road that brought him back. Repentance was the road that took him from the pig pen, the guilt, the shame, right back to the father's house. It was repentance that brought him home. I remember experiencing this embrace when I was 19 years old and when I turned my life back to, after growing up a Christian home and knowing the gospel in my mind, never really changing, never was real to it, but I always said I was a Christian. I always said I was a believer, but then living in sin, drawn into immorality and partying and drinking and sexual sin, just living this way and deceived into thinking this is fine and, you know, it's okay, I'm a Christian, da, 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 and all this. And then when I came to that place of true repentance, deep repentance, deep surrender, it, it literally was just, it literally felt just like this story. It was, it was like God was there waiting for that turning. And the moment of the turning, the moment of the confessing and the repenting, and the, it, was like, it was like that embrace was so real, so powerful. God loved me before I repented, but I wasn't in the love of God. I wasn't living in his love. I wasn't knowing his love. I wasn't experiencing his love. I was away from him without even realizing I was away. I was lost. So then notice the response, though, of the other son. The other son Here's the music. Here's the dancing. He hears a celebration going on. Notice his, his, his response. First of all, where, where was the son, the older son? In the field. Older son in the field, verse 25. He drew near to the house. He hears the music. He hears the partying. He hears the dancing. He finds out what's going on. He calls the servant. And they tell him what happens. And look at verse 28. He was angry and would not go in. I picture him with his hands folded, pouting. Like just. He was angry. He would not go in. So his father comes out to him and starts pleading with him. He says, lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandments. But you never gave me anything. You never gave me a, a celebration. You never gave me a young goat that I make, he says, make merry with my friends. And as soon as this son of yours, who squandered all of your livelihood with harlots, he, he squandered it in sexual sin, he squandered it in selfishness, he, squandered, he says, you know, he comes back and you throw him this big party. What's going on here? He's angry. I want you to understand something. Even though the older brother never technically left the house, he also was not living in the love of God. He was not living in the love of the father, even though the father loved him. Why? Because while the younger brother disconnected from the love of God through lawlessness, the older brother disconnected from the love of God through legalism. I mean, notice his statements. I've been serving you all these years. He's like, Dad, I've been slaving away for you. I never disobeyed your commandments. I never. But you know what? Legalism causes us to approach God out of a performance mentality. And when we approach God out of a performance mentality, we begin to take on entitlement. We begin to think we deserve this. We should get this. 
God owes me this because I did this so long. I served so well. I, God has to do this for me. God, I'm entitled to this. When we try to relate to God out of a, what is legalism? A, a legalistic mindset is trying to relate to God on the basis of our performance. It's trying to relate to God on the basis of the law, of how good we measured up. And when we try to relate to God that way, we actually disconnect ourselves from his love. The whole book of Galatians is written to teach us this because Paul wrote that book to a church where legalism had gotten in there and he had to really bring some correction. You know, some places like Corinth, he was correcting lawlessness. In Corinth, there was so much immorality. There was so much sin. There was all types of stuff happening. He had to correct that immorality. But to the Galatians, he had to correct the legalism. Because there's two branches from the same tree and they both disconnect you from Christ. I've been, I've been slaving away. I've been serving. I've been doing this. In other words, he's saying like, I'm earning my way to you. I'm earning your love. I'm earning your benefits. I'm earning your blessings. I'm And the thing about legalism is it takes the good things of God's word and it just misapplies them. It takes obedience. Like, we're, yeah, we're supposed to be obedient, but it's about a mindset. It's about a form of relationship. Obedience should come out of the inside out, not the outside in. Like, we should be like, Obeying God and pursuing Him and living, you know, for that living and holy and all those things, right? But but it's it's where is that coming from? What's the heart behind it? What's the motive behind it? What's the mindset with it? And so the father tries to bring him back into a sonship, understanding of sonship. Verse 31, he said, Son. See. The older brother was essentially referring to himself as slave, servant. And he says, son, he calls him back to sonship. Son, you are always with me. All I have is yours. What is he saying? He's saying, son, you have access to everything I have. You're my son. I love you. You're my son. You have access to all this. Not because you worked hard in the field today. But because relationship, you're my child, you're my son. He tries to bring him back to that understanding out of the legalistic mindset into a place of sonship. And here's the thing with these two sons. Here's the thing with these two sons. The younger son who left the house, squandered the wealth, I think he represents when we have a great understanding of sonship, but not an understanding of servanthood. It can lead us to a spoiled mentality. That, that's what that younger son, he got a spoiled mentality. You know, and there's some, some, sometimes as believers, we see this different in the church. Like, you know, sometimes people get a great revelation of like the promises of God and faith and like prosperity and, you know, blessing and you know, how to, how to appropriate God's promises, right? They get this great understanding of what it means to be a son, and they emphasize their rights, their privileges, and all this. And there's, like, there's, there's, half, there's some truth in it, but it's disconnected from servanthood, and it turns into spoiled. Sonship without servanthood will lead to a spoiled lifestyle, a spoiled mentality. God doesn't want us to be spoiled because he's a good father. He wants us to have abundance in him. He wants us to know his love. He wants us to, but here's the thing. He wants us to use what he gives us to serve, not for selfish ends, not to fulfill our own wishes, not to fulfill our own pleasures, to use it for his name, for his kingdom, and for others. And so sonship 
minus servanthood will lead to being spoiled. You see, but the older brother had the opposite problem. He had servanthood down. He, had, he knew how to serve really well. He had servanthood down. I mean, he lived in the field. That was part of his problem. He was well acquainted with the father's field, but he didn't know the father's house. He lived in the field. He slaved away. He served all the time. He worked really hard. Why? Because he thought, this is how I get my father's love. This is how I get my identity. This is how I get what, you know, is good for me. This is, but see, he had a misunderstanding. So servanthood minus sonship becomes a slave mentality. That's what the older brother had. Servanthood minus sonship. And it led to a slave mentality, which is legalism. Younger son, sonship minus servanthood, spoiled. Older son, servanthood minus sonship, slave. There's a third son. His name's Jesus. He was the perfect model of what it looked like to be a son and a servant at the same time. He was the perfect model of what it looked like to live in the full revelation of being a son, having a father in heaven who provides for me, who loves me, who cares for me, who leads me, who doesn't forsake me, and living from that place. Yet he had the full revelation of what it meant to use that position of sonship, not for his own benefit, but to serve the, the Lord and to serve others, to serve the Father and to serve others, to advance God's kingdom. Jesus was a son and Jesus was a servant. And these two truths are married together. And the Bible calls him both. The Bible calls him the son of God, obviously, many times. But you know that in the book of Acts, Peter referred to him as God's holy servant. God's holy servant. Why? Because both are true. See, sonship is the foundation, though. And then servanthood comes from that place. And when you marry those two together, you are rooted in God's love. You are secure as a daughter of God, as a son of God. And then you can live from that place. And then your serving is no longer an attempt to gain God's approval because you already have his approval. Because your approval comes from being in Christ Jesus. That's why in the book of Galatians, it says that we are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Through faith in Christ Jesus. You don't become good enough to become a son or a daughter. You're a son or a daughter through faith in Christ Jesus. The approval comes from being in Christ. Then you live from that place. You serve from that place. You love others from that place. In this older son, he missed it on this other extreme, right? These are two extremes that keep us from actually living in the love of the Father, knowing him as Father. But what would it be like, what would it be like if you, if me, if us, if believers all around the world, all around the city, all around Lancaster, all around this nation had a revelation of sonship and servanthood? What would that look like? What would it look like if you could actually rest in knowing that the Father loves you, but it doesn't lead you to get spoiled? It actually compels us to love others. Because that's what the love of God is supposed to do in us, right? We've been in this whole series on, on God's love, and it's we love him because he first loved us. We love others because we're filled with his love. It leads us to give ourselves, 
to pour ourselves out. So if lawlessness is the hindrance to receiving God's love, I said earlier, what's the, what's the remedy? Repentance. If legalism is the hindrance, what's the remedy? Repentance, in a different way. Or maybe it's renewal of the mind even. Right? Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because the fact of the matter is, if we have influences in our past, it can lend us toward a legalistic mindset. Our church upbringing, our family upbringing, our relationship with our parents. Maybe that's why some of us might struggle with this older brother concept. Because when we were growing up, we were taught that you had to perform to be loved. You weren't loved already unless you performed. Instead of, see, this is so important as parents, parents who are in this room, please listen, this is so important. Because how we parent, how we train, how we discipline, how we approach, how we connect, whether we know it or not, whether we like it, it's going to translate to our children's relationship with God. It just does. And none of us do it perfectly. There's only one perfect father. Only one. None of us do it perfectly. But I just want to encourage parents, fathers, mothers, like, we can discipline our children in a way that still shows that we approve of them and love them. How we talk to them how we act when they make a mistake. These things really matter. They translate into their mindset. They translate into their approach to God. I was just thinking earlier during worship, and maybe I shouldn't go here because I'll probably just start weeping, so... When I, was, when I was in my place of deception, rebellion, <clears throat> I remember I was a freshman in college and I was in the worst of this time. And I remember my, my dad came to visit in college. <clears throat> and I could, I could honestly say, I, I never once knew his disapproval. Even in the midst of, you know, he didn't know the full extent of what I was doing, but he knew enough. I mean, he's smart enough. He lived long enough as a non-Christian before he got saved. He <clears throat> and there was actually things I changed. There's literally things I changed. Even before my repentance, even before my full conversion, there was literally things I changed because I, I didn't want to disappoint him. Not in a, like, I was trying to earn his approval, but because of his, like, he 
he had such a way of allowing, he, like he didn't try to control, like he didn't. And even in his correction, which fathers correct, that's part of what fathers do, there was never a sense of disapproval. So if we, if we grow up in a culture that's filled with a performance, legalistic mindset, whether it's a church culture or a family culture, but those are two cultures that you know, influence us in our relationship with the Lord. If it's a family culture, if it's a church culture that is influenced by legalism, then what we need is we need a renewing of our mind of how to relate to God, not on the basis of my performance. But I'm relating to God on the basis of Jesus' sacrifice. I'm re- I relate to God on the basis of what Jesus did for me. I relate to the Father because Jesus said, you come to the Father through him. I come to the Father through Jesus. And I get changed in my heart. He lives inside of me. This changes how I think. He lives inside of me. This changes how I live. But it's not on the basis of measuring up to an impossible standard that I could never reach. Some of us tonight need to have that impossible standard lifted off of you. That you lived under an impossible standard. You had to earn Love. Love is not earned. Love is given. It's received. I want us to stand to our feet. Let's let's stand up. I want to begin to pray. If I could have a keyboard, I don't know if it's Tyler or whoever else is going to play on the keyboard. I'm just going to ask right now first before we do any other responses. I'm just going to ask for the Holy Spirit just to move and speak in this room, in the hearts of people. And I quoted earlier Romans 5.5. 5. It says, the love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom God has given us. I'm going to ask that God would do that across this room, those who are watching this. I'm going to ask that the Holy Spirit, because we need more than information to know God's love. We need revelation. We need more than just the right message. We need more than just the right information. We need more than just an intellectual understanding. We need a revelation. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We need the Holy Spirit to bear witness with our spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to pour the love of God in our hearts. And so, Father, right now, I come in the name of Jesus. Father, through the blood of Jesus that was shed, I come into your presence and I thank you. God, we behold, just like John told us, we behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God, that the God of this universe, eternal God, Creator God, the judge, the sovereign God is also my father. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And I ask God for every person in this place for the moving of the Holy Spirit in their hearts tonight. God, let your Holy Spirit fall upon hearts tonight. Let your Holy Spirit move and bring revelation tonight. 
God, I ask for conviction. Lord, I pray for repentance here tonight, God, from lawlessness. Repentance here tonight, God, from legalism. God, tonight we repent. We repent from being in the pig pen. And we also repent from only staying in the field and never coming to your house and living from your house. God, we turn. I ask for the renewing of the mind tonight in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for supernatural renewing of the mind in this place tonight, God. I pray it would happen now, God. I pray it would happen in this room right now, Father. I break the power of every lie of the enemy that's based on legalism. Every lie that came through household culture, through religious culture that was based in a performance mindset. In the name of Jesus, I break the power of those lies. I believe that the Lord wants to break the yoke of perfectionism tonight for some people. It's a heavy yoke. It's a bondage. It's an enslavement. It keeps us from entering his rest. It keeps us from being connected to his heart and his love. I just want you to pray in your own words. I want you to respond in your own way right now for a minute or two. If you need to come to the front, you can come to the front. If you need to pray where you're at, pray where you're at. Just however you feel like you need to respond right now. Holy Spirit, would you lead us? Would you lead us, God, in repentance? If there's need, things you need to repent of, if you've left the Father's house and embraced selfishness and lawlessness and sin, today's a day of repentance. Today's a day of salvation. If you've been like that older son and just in bondage to that legalism, you can repent, you can turn. I'm going to give you a minute or two in your own way just to respond. Thank you, Father. ask you to do the work by the Holy Spirit right now in hearts. Do it on the inside. Do it in hearts. Do it by revelation of your word, God. Do it by revelation of your spirit. In the name of Jesus. I'm supposed to really open up this altar and if you just need to respond and you just something in this message and you just say I need to I need to get in in the love of God I need to stay in the love of God I need to stay connected in the love of God and I've gone down this path or that path it's maybe it's the legalistic mindset or the performance mentality that's hindered me from knowing his love receiving his love maybe it's the leaving of the house the, the father's house of lawlessness but I just I want to pray specifically for those that are just sensing the Holy Spirit lead them and draw them tonight. So I'm just going to open up the altar and ask you to come forward if that's you. If you just, you want God to do that work in you as a revelation by the Holy Spirit. So if there's anyone else who's not already up here, I'm just going to wait a minute or two. Thank you, Father.
Thank you, Holy Spirit. Would you move on the hearts, God? Would you draw people, Father, to yourself? Would you draw people to yourself? Would you move, God? I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. Don't be ashamed to come forward. I think there's some men in the room that need to come forward. We got eight or nine ladies up here. Is there any men in the room that are sensing God's tug? I don't want you to come just because I'm saying that. But... Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I'm going to pray each one of this front, I'm, I'm going to ask that the Holy Spirit will literally do a supernatural work of renewing of the mind. There'd be, you'd be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You would literally be able to relate to God in a different way through Jesus. Not like the younger son, not like the older son, but as a, as a daughter, as a son, who's grounded and rooted in his love. So if you're, for those who are not at this front, I just wanna ask you to start interceding. And I'm not gonna take a long time on this. I'm just gonna do a, a, a group prayer and then I'm just gonna walk by and I'm just gonna lay my hand gently on each person's head. And it's gonna take like a couple seconds for each one, that's it. But I'm gonna ask that God would do the work. Father, in the name of Jesus, let the fire of the Holy Spirit, let the power of the Holy Spirit fall on each person that's at this front, God, in the name of Jesus. God, and I ask that transformation would happen today, God. I ask, Lord, that every yoke would be broken right now in the name of Jesus. I break the yoke of perfectionism in the name of Jesus. I break its power from your life. I command it to be lifted off in Jesus' name by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let it be broken, let it be released. Right now, I command every lying spirit that lies to your mind, I command it to go in the name of Jesus. Every lying spirit, I command, come out in Jesus' name. Every lying spirit connected to legalism, come out, I command it to go in the name of Jesus. Every spirit connected to perfectionism, I command, out, 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 go in the name of Jesus. God, I ask for a baptism of the love of God to fall right now in this place. And God, even as I lay hands on each one, even just quickly, I ask for the Holy Spirit to do the work, Lord, with the transformation of the renewing of the mind. 